I want you to turn with me. We're going to go right to a text, and I'll tell you what we're going to do when you get there. Turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 18. Yeah. I started that, a series several weeks ago on the church and its function, and, and we kept talking about in the book of Acts that they met together. This is what the church did. When the church was birthed, they continued in the apostles' doctrine. They continued in fellowship. They continued in breaking of bread and prayer. And then I started talking about prayer last week and mentioned some things about all the prayer that took place in the book of Acts, how they prayed in the book of Acts. So I just thought I would take another evening and just talk about prayer within itself because that's what they did. Prayer went on more than just in the book of Acts and what Jesus said and what the apostles did during that time. Jesus spoke about it. It was all the way through the Old Testament. People fellowshiped and prayed with God. Prayer is, as I said last week, it's not just a monologue where we just talk, 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 talk. Prayer is talking and fellowshipping and worship. Uh, when I go into prayer, I may sing unto the Lord, and he doesn't mind it. You guys, I wouldn't trust as much. Uh, but uh, he doesn't mind it. I, I just worship the certain things that I do. Uh, there's certain music that moves me in prayer, I, even though I don't need it to pray. And uh, don't ever become dependent up on music or something to pray because if you no longer have that, then you're stuck. So don't, don't, don't depend on something to stir your emotions to be able to spend time with God. Uh, you need to be able to spend time with God even if you don't have some kind of a motivator inside. You've got to know how to pray because some places you get to, you can't just put on worship music to pray. Uh, there's times I've been in buildings where I knew I needed to pray because I'm going into a meeting that was very crucial. So I had to learn how to pray and seek God without, without doing things. But saying that, there's times I go into it and I love it. And as Shannon quoted me the other day, there's certain music I, call, I play, I call it my traveling music because it helps take me somewhere. And uh, it sets an atmosphere for that. But prayer was all the way from the Old Testament through the New Testament. And, you know, the worship we have now, it wasn't around 20 years ago. And it surely wasn't around 50 years ago. How many knows progression has changed? Different things has changed. We didn't have the lighting, light, you know, lighting and LED lighting like that. It, it wasn't in the churches uh, 25, 30 years ago. It didn't, we didn't have the LED like that technology. So as technology goes, the church goes with it. But we should not base our enjoyment of God up on technology. It still should come from the heart and allow that stuff to just still accompany, accompany what's going on, but we still need to be able to worship from the heart, okay? So prayer is something very important to all of us, but we have to understand that it's more than just talking out or just doing all the talking. In prayer time, I'm, I worship. In prayer time, I just may sing. There's times I'll start praying for the government and don't get any further than the government. I remember years ago, Jeff and Lisa Rotz are now members here, and uh, Jeff and I were always close friends, and when he was on staff back at New Creations many years ago, I was traveling, wasn't even just way before pastoring, so I've been here pastoring for 16 years now. This is 16th year, so it's been probably 20 years ago, or 20-some years ago, I would preach uh, some of the minister's conferences over there at, uh, over there at the New Creations uh, when they held, hosted minister's conferences. And I was in uh, Fort Worth, Texas in a meeting, and I got this call from Jeff Rotz. And I had just been preaching. Now, if he was here, he could help me if I'd missed a, a detail. I just finished doing a meeting there, and I talked about prayer in that meeting. And in talking about prayer, it stirred his heart, and he asked me if he could come and meet with me to pray. And so I had never had anybody ask me. He said, I'm not uh, looking for anything. I just want to pray. So we met uh, at a place to pray. And he said, I'm not looking for word. I'm not looking for anything. I just want to be in prayer with you. He said, I just like to observe how you pray. Uh, how many knows that you observe people how to do things? Uh, when I was taking flight instruction, I observed the flight instructor do certain maneuvers and try to do what they did. And so, uh, you know, it was a little uncomfortable because I've never had anybody ask me that. 
But I, I take back the friendship that Jeff Rotz and I have today and what we do. It didn't just start when they started here. It started back when our hearts connected in prayer. And so what people see today, they don't realize that everything has a, a seed, a starting point to that. And uh, I told him, this is what I usually do. And back, I had a certain CD at that time I put on. I said, I just begin to worship God. I worship God out of my spirit. I worship God out of my understanding. And I begin to pray. I pray in the natural. I pray in the spirit. I only know what to pray for in the natural, but God knows what to pray for in the spirit. So I give God equal time to pray in the spirit as well as I pray in the natural. And then the Bible says, first of all, prayer, supplication, intercession, giving of thanks. Let your request be made in to all men in the book of Timothy, uh, for those are in authority for kings, for rulers, and and uh, different things like that, and it gives them to name it. So if we're going to do first thing first, I begin to pray for kings, which we don't have a king here. We have presidents. Some of the countries work we work in that I've preached in have kingdom. When I preached in Thailand, they have the king. Uh, when I when I preached in uh, uh, Swaziland, we have covenant of peace. Swaziland, Swaziland doesn't have a president. Swaziland is not a a a na- uh, it, it's not a republic, it's not a nation, it's a kingdom. And so they still have a king. The king runs everything, controls everything. So uh, we don't have a king. We have a president, a vice president, so I'd begin to pray. God, I thank you for those who are in authority, for the top to the bottom. Now, I didn't just stop with the federal government. I prayed federal government, still do. Federal government, state government, local government. Uh, I'd pray for those in authority as far as law enforcement, uh, people and teachers and different things like that that has influence on people's lives. So I'd begin to pray, and, and I would say, thank you, Father, that the president, not, 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 and not every election is there a president that I, that I just shouted about. You know what I mean? So sometimes you got to force yourself to pray by faith because the Bible commands it. Come on. And uh, so you pray. Father, first of all, prayer. I pray. I thank you. I thank you for this office of the president. I thank you for the office of the president. Uh, They're making decisions, even though they don't have all the decisions, because they're governed by the way our system is. Uh, We have different branches in the system, but I pray for our president. I pray for his family. I pray for his household. But specifically, I pray for those that are feeding him information. He doesn't know everything. He's bound by what he's been told. I pray for the people that speaks into his ears. May the words of truth come across their mouth. May everything that's not right, may it be stopped. May it be judged. May they understand and and I pray for protection upon them. I don't want to be a nation that has a president assassinated and and so I pray for protection upon them and the family and and uh, so then I said I pray for also the president and the vice president. I prayed for the staff. I prayed for the cabinet and then I went to the legislator. Then I went to the judicial system and just begin to pray and then for the governors and and for the same thing the legislator, the judicial system, the house and different things within our state and and so forth and I begin to do that and sometimes that particular day that Jeff was there I never got out of the government never never got out of it just kept praying about it and I mean God got so strong and never felt I had to force it and when I felt the spirit of prayer lift I thank God and prayed about a few family things and didn't say, well, I guess I messed up because I didn't pray about the other five, six, seven, or eight. No, I felt fulfilled because what I went in there to accomplish was not to do my thing, but to do heaven's thing. Yes. Come on. Yes. So that's what it's about. So prayer becomes something very crucial that we have when we talk to God. As one, as one great man of God that did so many things for God, you know, he was in such a need and he ran in to God and he ran out. He ran into God and he ran out. And, and one day he ran in before God has done before, fell on his face before God and was crying out as he always does. And he paused and stopped. And he said out loud, here lies a fool doing all the talking. Who lies a, here lies a fool who knows nothing doing all the talking to a God who knows everything. He would run in and talk and get up and leave. Run in and talk, get up and leave. And never give God a chance to say anything. Sometimes you go into prayer, you get this, whatever heaviness or anxiety is on you, if you cry a few tears and you get a little bit emotional, that will lift off of you. So inside we think, well, I must be done, and we run out of prayer. And so apparently that's what he did. And he said, here lies a fool, a man who knows nothing, doing all the talking to a God who knows everything. And once he learned to hear from God, he began to change his life and his 
situation. So prayer is not just a one way. Prayer is a multifaceted conversation between you and God. And uh, you need to be able to enjoy it. Uh, as I mentioned the last, uh, last week, that I wanted to pray. I always had a desire to pray. I prayed. I remember when I was in Rama, uh, had a couple roommates, and um, one of them uh, didn't like anybody to pray loud. And I'm in, the, I'm in the bedroom, you know, my little bedroom, praying loud. And so I got into my closet to pray loud. My closet was adjacent to his bedroom and he got us and I'm in there praying and, and just pouring my heart out, just crying and, and slobbering and, and uh, just giving it all I got with all the knowledge that I have. And he gets a chair and gets up in the, in the duck in the ceiling and uh, is going to speak to me to shut up. Ken, this is God. I'm not deaf. He shook me. And I said, and he's not nervous. He doesn't care about something loud. People say loud noise makes me nervous. God doesn't get nervous. <laughs> but so prayer is something that we need to understand and we need to be able to chase with our heart. Now, the concept of you can't pray enough to please God, I don't buy it. You can't, you can't give enough, you cannot give God. I buy that. But to say you can't give enough to please God, you can't pray enough to please God, I don't know if I buy that because faith is what pleases God. Prayer is not what pleases God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You can pray two hours and not add faith to it and still not please God because it's not prayer that pleases God. Faith is what pleases God. And there's people in this church and the people that I know that work and they get up early and they work all day and they work late and... and uh, you know, you take somebody like Angel or an Allie and that's in tax season and hits so many hours a day and seven, six days a week and, and responsibilities and uh, with everything in there. If somebody or somebody that's on a medical floor that they can walk and pray as they walk around and, you know, you can walk to pray from meeting to meeting, restroom breaks or whatever. But for somebody to say, I'm going to take two hours out for devotion and pray and read, it may not always be possible. But whatever you do, you do it by faith and you do it with all of your heart. If you got 10 minutes, give it all you got for 10 minutes. And don't allow shame and guilt and condemnation to climb on you because you don't just spend one hour every day. I've had someone say, if a person doesn't pray an hour a day, he's not worth his salt. Whatever that phrase means, I just heard it. But the truth is, uh, some people with situations going on, maybe they can't get an hour. Maybe they have 20 minutes. Maybe they have 15. Maybe they get 30 minutes. But whatever you do, you do it by faith. And you do it with all of your heart. And you honor God and you worship God and you love God with everything in you. I don't want, I wouldn't want, you know, I, my relationship with Angel, my kids, I wouldn't want it to be just, you know, mechanical. Mechanical. I, I like spontaneity. I like something that's fresh. And I don't want my relationship with God to be mechanical. I don't want my prayer life to be mechanical. Come on. And so these are things that we understand. Prayer becomes very important to our life and to our function in the kingdom of God. And so, so we must understand that it's, it's very important uh, to do this. As, uh, as one person says, regardless of any man's ability, he will fail if not backed by prayer. Failure of all Christian enterprise is a, fa is a prayer failure usually where we don't pray. So the Old Testament showed prayer. The prophets prayed. They put their head between their knees and they prayed and they sought God when, when there needed to be rain. Elijah prayed. And so a lot, his prayer was not just a New Testament thing. It wasn't just when Jesus came in the name of Jesus, people prayed. All right. So here in Luke chapter 18, if you haven't found it by now, you need more than, no, I'm sorry. Then he spake a parable to them, verse 1, that men ought always to pray and not faint. Now, there's something here that this, he spoke as a parable. Men always ought to pray, always ought to pray and not faint. Men ought always to pray and not faint. That's what they ought to do. So what he's saying here, if you pray... You may, be not, you, you may not faint. 
You're saying, how does that come into play, Pastor? The book of Galatians says, do not grow weary in well-doing, for you shall reap if you faint not. Actually, you start the whole context off. It says, do not be deceived, for God's not mocked. For what's over a man sows, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to the, to the flesh of the flesh shall reap corruption. But he that sows to the spirit shall reap life everlasting. So do not grow weary in well-doing, for you shall reap if you faint not. So he's talking about, you know, reaping and sowing and, and different things like that. But he says, don't grow weary. Too many people grow weary and quit before they get the answer. And then just because the answer doesn't come right when you think it is, don't go badmouth God and say, I guess God doesn't care. God does care. God is a God that cares. God is a God that loves. God is not slack concerning the things that he provided for us. His hand is not too short that he can't get to you. But remember, everything that God does and everything that God has, you're going to possess it because of your faith. God, heal me. Well, why do you want to heal? I hurt so bad. He don't want you healed because you hurt. God set me free. Because why, why do you want God set you free? Because I'm so tormented. He, 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 doesn't, it's not, he doesn't want to set you free just because you're tormented. He wants to heal you because he loves you. He wants, to, he, he wants to set you free because he loves you. Because he gave his son to do it for you. And we base everything off of, I need God to do this because of this current need. God wants to be God because he's love, he's righteous, he's good. Are you getting it? So it's not just because you hurt. Because what are you going to do when you quit hurting? What are you going to do then? Nothing? No, you still got to depend on a God of love. A God of goodness. So many times I said, Father, you know I hurt. But I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not asking. I'm not, I'm not sitting here believing that I just need you because I hurt. I need you because you're God and, 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 you're, and you're vital to my life and you're vital to my existence. And you want to do this not because I hurt. You want to do this because you love me and because you gave Jesus to redeem me out of this. Now we're getting to the biblical aspect of it. Amen. He wants you healed because Jesus redeemed you out of it. Because he redeemed you out of it. God's got to provide for me. Why? Because if he don't provide, I'm going to go under. Uh, he's, it's not just, okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to provide just so you don't go under. Now, what are you going to do when you don't go under? You're going to forget about God until you bury to go under again. No, he, he wants sons and daughters. He wants to be a father. Come on. He wants to be a father. I don't always want to just... Bless my kids because they have a need. It's all right to bless them when they don't have a need. Somebody asked me one time about, you know, giving to people I look to and honor. Well, they don't need that money. They got more money than you. I don't give it to them because they need it. I give it to them because I need it. I don't honor. I don't honor the men that God put in my life because I need to honor them I, I do it because it affects my life yeah. honors for me come on tithe and I don't tithe I, I don't bring the holy tithe because God's poor I bring it because it's it, it benefits me I, I've told more than one person my needs are not met by your giving to me. My needs are met by my giving to my God. Well, yeah, it's, it's our approach to God. Or our lack of approach to God or how we approach God sometimes messes with how we receive from God. If we approach God with a different attitude, we may receive in a different fashion. I don't want to give to that ministry. They got all kind of money. Well, it's not about what they have. It's about obedience from our hearts because it, what it does, it affects, it affects us, not them. That's right, yeah. Come on. I know I got to get to this. Don't faint. You pray so you don't faint. 1999. I remember the year because I remember what I was preaching that year and what God spoke to my heart. But uh, in 1999, which is a long time ago now, 
uh, I was I did a meeting in Fort Lauderdale, and uh, that's the meeting that I did. And I got back, and all the monies I brought back, I was leaving for Africa a week later, and all the the checks bounced and all that. You know, it was that I, I went with nothing. And I called Angel. Angel told me, he said, that check bounce, that $1,000 check bounce that they gave you. And uh, that's what I was leaving there to operate all of the Lightnings of God expenses. And she said, what do you want me to do? I said, they got the same letter we did, insufficient funds. But you call them. I said this word. I said, I feel like I'm fighting every demon on this side of East Africa. You call them and tell them. I sow that check to them. I sow it to them. I sow it to them. Never did offer to make it right as a friend or a pastor. But I said, I sow it to them. I wasn't, didn't feel bad because they didn't because I sold it to them. I came out of there. I know it was 99 because it's the first year that Wayne Gardner went with me. Because I remember the situation. We got, we got in on that trip. And uh, when I got back from Africa after being gone right about three weeks, I was invited to preach in a tent meeting. You have somebody heard me tell the story in Hamilton. A uh, friend of mine. Uh, who owned a tent. He did tent revivals all over. He gave it to, a, he gave his tent, chairs and all, to a young evangelist in Georgia. And so this pastor in Hamilton got a hold of that young evangelist in Florida and said, if you bring your tent up here in the chairs and host my meeting, because the guy that gave it to you, he's the one who always did it for me. If you do that, I'll give you half of all the offerings. So, the guy that originally had the tent is the one who told the pastor in Hamilton to have me to come and speak. So I did. I mean, I got home from Africa. It was the second night after I was home. I went down there and preached. I got home, say I got home on uh, Thursday. I was preaching Friday night. So that next night, I was preaching pretty much the next day. And so while I was there, I was talking to the man, the young man that owns the tent that my friend once owned. And he was telling me about all the things, how the meeting was going. And we were just sharing about me just getting back from Africa. I didn't say anything about having a need, money. I never mentioned a word. I just came to preach. So they had the worship and they got ready to uh, introduce me. And the guy, the young evangelist, he said, uh, Pastor, he said, uh, I really don't know this young man is preaching tonight. And I was young then, if anybody was, con- was wondering. Uh, I don't know this young man that's preaching tonight, but just talking with him before the service. He said this in front of God and everybody. Out of my portion of money, out of my portion of money, I want you to sow $1,000 into his life. As soon as he said that, I heard as if, as if Madison, Brittany, Angel, or somebody was in the car. I heard it as plain as day. Uh, this happens so many times. That the gifts of the Spirit operates this way many times. And I heard this as loud as can be. Well, if he got a 1000 he don't need any more money. It sounded just like that, identical. I didn't even add anything to it. That's what it sounded like. And I knew who said it. The pastor. I knew who said it. So I got up eventually and preached, and I said, Brother, thank you for sowing that $1,000. He did not know that that check that happened to bounce that I sowed was $1,000. That $1,000 just breaking even. There's, if the thief steals something, there's, got to, there's an increase. He'll pay seven times. So more of it's going to come from somewhere. So I got up and I said this, just as, just as plain. I said, I want to thank you for that. And I said, once he said it, I heard a voice say, well, if he got $1,000, he don't need anything else. I said, before I preach, let me settle it. It's not by your giving that meets my need. It's by my giving that meets my need. Now let's turn and open the Bible. Let me tell you. We do things not because, we we, we don't give to God because God needs it. We don't come to God and pray because God's lonely. We do it because we need the Father to touch our life. And we need to make connection with that power source. Are you with me? Men ought always to pray and not faint. So don't grow weary. Don't grow weary. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Don't, don't ever allow the enemy to mess with you. Well, you don't need to give. The church has got plenty. You don't need to give. This has happened. You, you don't need to honor that. That's it. Don't ever grow weary in well-doing. Don't ever do it. You will reap 
if you faint not. Come on. You'll reap if you faint not. Well, let's try verse 2 and let's see if it'll take us as long. So let's go back at one again and read it together in, in harmony here. Then he spake a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart or faint. Saying there was a certain, uh, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard men. Sound like a real character, isn't it? Anybody ever met anybody? Well, I'm sorry. Not going to. Now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. The judge it says, I want you to get justice for me. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard men, yet because this woman troubles me, I will avenge her. Lest by her continuing coming, she weary me. Huh? Lest she weary me. Amen. Well, let's just pray. Father, we just thank you. Whatever this is is coming. We rebuke this storm. We rebuke it. We command this wind to cease. In the name of Jesus, we speak to it. We speak to it. In the name of Jesus, by the authority of God, we speak to it to cease. We cover ourselves. Angels, take charge. Take charge in the name of Jesus. Take charge in the name of Jesus. We decree it and declare it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you for a hedge of protection around all of us. Thank you for a hedge of protection around our property. Thank you for a hedge of protection around our children. Thank you for a hedge of protection. Peace, 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 peace is our portion. 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 Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, let's go back to that. Verse 5 again. Yet because this woman troubles me, I will avenge her. Lest by her continuing coming, she weary me. So that means, woman, I can't take it anymore. Lest you weary me. Lest you weary me. I'm just going to go ahead and give it to you. Josh was. Josh has a mind like a steel trap when he wants something. He, he doesn't let go of it. He doesn't let go of it. And there are certain things I have bought for him. This particular guitar that he had. He wanted. He was younger. And uh, constantly. Constantly. Tried every angle in the world to keep it before me. And I remember where it was at. I had no desire to get it because, oh, I love you so much, son. I went that day to get it because he was flat wearing me out. <laughs> and I thought about this verse many times. Lest he weary me. I mean... Less dollars in my pocket was a whole lot more peaceful than him doing that. Amen. So, let me finish reading this and we'll talk about it. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. Pay attention to what he said. And shall not God avenge his own elect? Shall not God avenge his own elect? Who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them. How quick? How quick? Uh huh. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find begging in the earth? What is it? Faith. See, what I said, uh, it's not prayer, it's faith. It's faith. It's faith is what pleases God. It's faith is what pleases God. When he comes, will he find faith? It's faith that pleases God. Now, 
with this, we, we know that uh, begging God, I'm just going to continue to beg God. Well, number one, you're not a beggar. You're a son. You're a daughter. I tell people all the time, quit, act, quit approaching God like you're an old beggar. Most people beg are not even in faith. They're not even in faith. They have no confidence that it's going to happen, so they feel like they have to beg. There was a rich man who was wicked and a poor man named Lazarus who begged at the gate, you know, asking for food at the gate. He, he had no, I'm talking, he had to beg because this man, this man was godless. He ended up in hell. That's not a parable. For certain, there was a rich man. And a man, for, for the Bible to talk about a place and a, and a particular name is not a parable. So it's not like, well, hell's a parable. It's not a parable. For certain. Hell is hell. If you miss heaven, there's not another alternative. It's hell. And it's going to be just as eternity. It's going to be just as eternal as heaven. It will never end. It'll never end. So don't get to the place where you feel like you got to beg God. Don't beg God to forgive you. Don't beg God to provide for you. You believe. You continue to come to God. The Bible says uh, in Matthew chapter 7, he says, uh, knock and keep knocking. Seek and keep seeking. Ask and keep asking. For he that, he that knocks, it shall be opened. He that seeks, shall find. He that asks, shall receive. So you just keep asking, seeking, and knocking. Asking, seeking, and knocking. Ask, seek, and knock. If you don't know how to do it, ask Josh. He'll help you. <laughs> ask, seek, and knock. Ask, seek, and knock. That's what you do. Now, word of faith, uh, the word of faith that I was introduced to, what I call the, was the real pure word of faith. Some of it today, I don't, anyways, beside the point. Uh, Some of that even got people a little confused, and that is, well, once you pray, uh, if you pray again, you're out of faith. And that was what we're taught. You pray and you're out of faith. Okay, I, I agree with that. Because once you pray, then you, then you don't pray again. But I, just because somebody prayed, I'm not convinced they were in faith the first time they prayed. So now we get into this, this area to where people get condemned because nothing happens. And they pray and people tell them, now don't pray a second time. If you pray a second time, it's not going to happen. Well, if I, don't, even, don't even think. If you waver, don't even think you're going to receive something from God. I mean, I want you to pray again. And they're sitting there going, oh my God, I can't pray again, but I don't believe I received anything. And so in the essence, they don't pray again, but they're still not going to receive because the first time they pray, they didn't pray that they believed they received anyway. It got all, all discombobulated. It got all, I mean, people got it. I was one of them. Oh my God, you know, I got to pray. I got I to gotta pray again. I got, but I can't pray again. If I pray again, I'm out of faith. And without faith, God won't answer. I can't please God. But the day I realized, the first time I prayed, I didn't pray in faith to begin with. So when you pray, you better believe that you receive them when you pray and you shall have them. There's been many times I prayed, I didn't believe I received them when I prayed. And you know the answer? I didn't receive them. But there is a place in God. In prayer, you can believe that you receive and you will have. So, why would Jesus say knock and keep knocking, ask and keep asking, if there was something about praying one time and not praying again? No. Here's why you don't pray again. If you're so convinced that when you prayed, faith was released, and not a devil in hell can stop it, it's yours, regardless of what it looks like, you don't need to pray again. I mean, if you're that convinced you got it, why would you pray again? But not everybody prays with that kind of faith, and they don't believe they receive with that kind of faith. Instead of getting into condemnation and shame about it, let's get an understanding about the Bible and get it done right so we can start receiving right. Whosoever shall say to this mountain, that's a problem. Be thou cast into the sea. Whosoever say this mountain, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, not his mind, his heart, but shall believe those things which he says shall come to pass. He shall have 
whatsoever he saith. Now, now, there's times I've prayed, my mind was so active and it was so tormented that I have a hard time believing what I was saying. You know, there's a thing about, there's a thing that says, uh, and having done all to stand, stand therefore. So the question I've asked people for a long time, how do you know when you've done enough to stand? Just quoting that verse doesn't mean you've done enough to stand. How do you know when you've actually done enough to stand? I'll tell you how you know. Because you can face the same adversity and you step into a sweatless anointing. And you know for a fact it doesn't matter what happens. Glory to God. You could almost do a victory shout and dance because it is really going to happen. There's a knowing in your knower. Then you done know you've done enough. <laughs> and I believe people fall short before they get there sometimes. Mark eleven twenty four. For what things soever you desire when you pray. Believe you receive them. When? When you pray. And you shall have them. So, and when you stand praying, forgive. So it talks about all this forgiveness and things that's going on. So people got into bondage because, you know, I can't pray a second time. Well, praying a second time is not a lack of faith. If, if you really believe you didn't faith the first time, you won't have a desire to pray a second time. So sometimes our mind will mess with us and you can't listen to your head. But you've got to make sure when you pray that you are believing, you receive. We, we can't deceive ourselves in it. Am I making sense? We can't deceive ourselves in it. There's times I know that my head was so active that I couldn't pray. Let me talk about the story with Brittany. That year that I was in Africa, I've been there for several days. I get a call from here that Brittany was having these seizure-like symptoms. Now, Brittany choked, and I really believe that she died in my arms at age two, over candy corn. If there's ever a candy that I cannot stand to look at that's as useless and worthless is candy corn. I didn't even like eating it, and I surely don't like it. You're still her favorite. I want she wants to eat it, but she literally... She literally, down on Eaton Avenue, she literally died in my arm, lost all her body function. She was gone. I couldn't get any response. 911 wasn't connected yet. I called. I could hear sirens. I put her in my car. I took her back out, laid her on the garage floor, and just put my hands up to heaven and just cried out to God, I know, God, you are good. And she started making a gurgling sound. Well, after that, she started having seizures. And then it started going into this. She had seizures here. Squads come up here before when she was a little girl. And, and uh, she'd fall asleep next to me and wake up and, and be in a seizure. And every time a fireworks would go or go where it's bright light, she'd, and it's just all messed up. And, and uh, they don't know if it, something happened to her brain where she was uh, out for so long. They don't know really what happened to it. But then she started having these things that were shaken. And I got a call that uh, we're, we're holding her, but it's like we just counted 300 times within so many minutes that she was shaken. And I just got back to the, to the sports view. And, and uh, you know, it don't matter what the age of kids now. I mean, this is your babies, and it's, it's there. And that's the story I tell you. When I, you tell stories sometimes. They come out of stories of just preaching examples. But when we got back through there, several of us went into the sports view hotel there and was going to dinner that night after that crusade meeting and uh i got to got the call and they all said well let's pray i said i can't pray right now you guys go eat and i went out in this little court art courtyard area pitch dark and i began to pray what did i do i had to beat fear back i had to beat anxiety back because i wasn't going to pray in fear i wasn't going to pray with the image of my daughter dying i wasn't going to pray with all of that that messes with your ability to take your authority and uh and so i got myself to the place to where where i got that lifted off of me she'll live and not die 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 i got it to where faith was rising up in me i said now let's pray because, you know, I wanted to make sure when I prayed, I didn't have to tunnel through all of that other junk. When I prayed, I needed to make sure it was done. I wasn't going to sit there and preach for another week and a half wondering what's happening. When I prayed, I wanted to know what was done. So I, had, I, I cleaned out all of that junk in my head. I cleaned out all of them emotions. So when I attacked this thing in the spirit, it was attacked. Amen? It was attacked. And so... You know, 
I heard Brother Hagin say many years ago, sometimes we pray too quick. Now, sometimes you don't have a chance to think. It's just, Jesus! Welcome to the service, some of you. <laughs> That's been asleep for the last 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, so, Jesus. Sometimes you can't think you got to do that. But other times, sometimes you got to just, you got to clear out all of that hindrance and then pray. Are you with me? Clear all that hindrance and pray. And then that's where it's at here. So, lest she weary me, I'm going to do this. If this godless man is going to answer, how much more will our Heavenly Father answer? He's not playing hard to get. God is not playing hard to get at all. He is there. He is there. And so we must understand what he's there for. Uh, Let's go. Let's get another verse in. If you would, go to the book of Hebrews. Does your Bible have Hebrews in it? All right. The book of Hebrews chapter 13. Let me just go to 20. This is like the benediction of, of Hebrews, but I want to use this to bounce off somewhere here. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Now just that verse gets me excited. There's something about that. that to me, that verse is always powerful. Make you complete in every good work in his will. Now, number one, God doesn't want us frayed here and there. He wants us complete. He made us that way. He made uh, the ability. Make you complete in every good work to his good will. Working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. So, he wants to work through us. He, he, God, God doesn't just want us to just sit here and be his little puppets, his little minions on the earth. God wants to use you. God wants to flow through you. Uh, it's not just, oh God, here I am again. No, there's more to walking with God than just that. I tell you what, God enjoys you when you're with him. God enjoys. God has good things in store for all of you. God has good things in store. God has good things in store. Oh, God, just, you know, we don't need much. God, just uh, any, anything above your just normal needs is excessive. Well, God's, a, I found out God's an excessive God. If he, if he was concerned about money, he surely messed up with, uh, with Abraham. And he surely messed up with Solomon. He didn't give Solomon that money, so Solomon can end up being stupid. 700 wives, 300 wives, 700 concubines, mistress wives, 1,000 women. Now, what man can handle? I mean, here's the deal. God said, I'll, let you, I'll give you one. That'll be a full-time. Just take care of her. Just take care of her. Amen. Just take care of her. That's the whole deal. If we do it right, we wouldn't have time for anything else. Yeah. Come on. Amen. Just take care of it. Amen. And so, uh, but, but God didn't, if, if it was about money, he really messed up. Messed up with David. Messed up with a lot of people. God doesn't mind you having things. He just don't want things to have you. God doesn't mind you being a part of stuff. He just don't want you to allow that stuff to take you away from him. You know how many people I've seen that, that they prayed for, for a certain job and they were faithful to the house of God, usher, taught, did everything, and all of a sudden they got too busy for God? God didn't give you that to take you away from him. And anything in your life that's taking you away from God, I would reevaluate it quickly. Making sure the devil's not setting you up for disaster. I'd evaluate it quickly. Quickly. I would, because God, what God puts in our hands is to bless us and honor Him. 
Amen? That's what he does, to bless us and to honor him. So anything that's keeping you away from the will of God, I'd reevaluate it quick. I'd reevaluate it quick. Well, you know, that brother did well until he got money. Money changed it. Money don't change anyone. I come to find out. I found out many, many years ago, money along with other things is a magnifier. When you have a little bit, you can't, it doesn't magnify much. It doesn't magnify what's in the heart. It's just that the more you get, the magnifying glass gets a little stronger. I know people that had bunches of it and stay just as humble as pure before God. Because it magnifies what's really there. That's why I keep my heart right with money. Let him load me down. I promise you I know how to give it away. <laughs> load it down. Money's a magnifier. Certain things are a magnifier. People get certain positions, and they said that position changed them. It's not the position. It's what was already in their heart. Come on. It's what's already in their heart. It magnifies things in you. If you got pride, it'll magnify it. Whatever you got, it magnifies. So prayer is something that we must really need to understand. So, uh, so if you don't mind, I don't really bother me if you mind, but... Uh, I'm going to talk about some different kinds of prayer next time. We talk about just some foundational things. We're, we're going to talk about, you know, what, you know, about the kinds of prayer. Prayer that changes things like the prayer of agreement, the prayer of binding and loosing, the prayer of petition, the prayer of intercession, the prayer of thanksgiving, the prayer of dedication, the prayer of worship. Let's just talk about some of these things and see what they can do to help us. And, uh, and just quit being one-dimensional. And let's be multidimensional in our things with God. Amen. Now I want to take a few minutes so we can pray. Let's stand.